Awesome. So good to be up here with you guys. We have some great stuff that we're going to be covering today. Always a privilege to be uh, here and joining you guys on a Sunday morning. I never take this for granted. Um, as you guys may have learned, today we are starting a new series. It's going to be a, a, an eight-week series or, or part nine-week series uh, on the book of 1 Corinthians. We're calling this series Called to be Saints. Called to be Saints. You're here for the first week. I encourage you to stick through it for the rest of our series. It's going to continue. Um, make that commitment, guys. Make that commitment to be here uh, for our entire study of 1 Corinthians. I want to lay some groundwork of what we can expect from this series, and then we are going to cover the first 17 verses of 1 Corinthians, okay? What can we expect from our series called to be saints. It's an eight-week study of 1 Corinthians. We're not going to go through every single verse of 1 Corinthians. As much as I would love to do that, we would be here until 2021. Not practical, okay? And so what we're going to be doing is what I have termed a loose exegesis. It means that we're covering major portions or major themes of 1 Corinthians every week at a time. Some weeks it's 17 verses. Other weeks it may be two chapters. It just depends every week. What I do guarantee you is that we are going to cover every chapter, every theme, every topic in 1 Corinthians. More than that, what we cover on Sunday morning is also going to be discussed in more detail on Friday nights. Many of you are part of our small communities that we have peppered all over Miami. Some of them meet here in the church building. And on Friday nights, what we're going to be doing is discussing 1 Corinthians in more detail, okay? If you're not part of a small community, I personally invite you to become part of a small community. You don't have to sign your name in blood. There's no application process. You just got to meet somebody and start coming, okay? More information on that uh, outside at the information table if you're interested. So that's what our series is going to look like, okay? What I want to do today is cover the first 17 verses of 1 Corinthians, and I want to emphasize something in specific. The way that Paul talks about this idea of saints or sanctified or holiness. Last week, Pastor Sergio gave us a sermon uh, that was about holiness, and we've also shared with all of you that that is one of our visions for this year. We want 2020 to be a year where we as a church grow in our holiness, not just in terms of understanding God's holiness, but having that holiness reflect in our lives. 1 Corinthians is part of that. Let me give you guys a little bit of background on 1 Corinthians. We call it a book of the Bible. It's actually a letter. It's one of the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. The Corinth was one of the major cities in the Greek Isles or in the, Gre the Greek area, if you will. Uh, it was a very carnal city. There was a lot of sin going on. Number one, it was a port city. Number two, they had a god that was the god of fertility, and they employed hundreds of temple prostitutes. It was part of the city's DNA. More than that, I mentioned it was a very wealthy city. Sin was accepted, and they had the money to commit sin. Sin was normalized in Corinth. Paul founded personally the church in Corinth in Acts chapter 18. If you guys want the background of the founding of the church of Corinth, you can read it in Acts chapter 18. We know that Paul stayed there for a time, a significant amount of time. And then also one of the early church leaders, uh, leaders ministered in Corinth as well. His name was Apollos. And so Paul founds a church in Corinth. He continues on his missionary journey, founding all churches in different parts of Asia Minor. And he, he starts receiving reports that the church in Corinth is not doing so well, is not doing so well. And so he begins to get concerned, and he begins writing letters to them, and he begins getting word from them. And there's this ongoing correspondence. Most scholars believe that the, book of first, uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians is actually the second letter that Paul writes to them, not the first. And basically, Paul had heard from members of Chloe's household, as we'll read today, that there were divisions in the church, and he had heard other things. And so Paul writes this huge letter, basically addressing all of those points one by one. But more than that, we see at the beginning of the book that Paul identifies the purpose of the book. He says that he's writing to address the division in the church. And more than that, Paul is encouraging the first Corinthians, or rather the Corinthians, to align their status with their standing. 
He tells them that they have been called to be saints and that God has already sanctified them. And he's encouraging those two identities to line up into one. So let's do this. Let me go ahead and read the first 17 verses out loud. You guys can follow me in your own Bibles or on the screens. And then we'll go through those verses and I'll point out some things that I want us to see. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in every way you were enriched in him and all speech and all knowledge, even as a testimony about Christ, was confirmed among you so that you were not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Verse 15, so that none of you may say that you were baptized in my name. I did, verse 16, I did baptize also the households of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. First 17 verses, that's what we're going to cover this morning. I love the way that Paul introduces this book, this letter. He introduces it much in the same way that he introduces all of his other letters. He identifies himself. He says who he is. He calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. What I want to call your attention is to verse 2. Look how Paul identifies the church in Corinth. He says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. That's his introduction. Now, Paul is no stranger to all of the sin that is happening in the Corinthian church. As we go through the book of Corinth, 1 Corinthians, you will realize all of the terrible things that were going on in this church. And it's curious to me that Paul chooses to call them saints, to remind them that they have been called to be saints. Now, let's pause for just one minute. This word saint carries a little bit of baggage, especially for many of us in this room who perhaps before coming to the Lord, coming to know Lord Jesus Christ, we were Catholics. And in the Catholic Church or the Roman Catholic Church, the word saint means someone that has been officially recognized and uh, given the title of saint under the Roman Catholic Church. And there's a ton of saints. Many of us in this room may have even been named for saints. When the Roman Catholic Church refers to a saint, I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. Paul is not talking about a super class of Christians that have performed miracles and have been verified and recognized by the official church. That's not what he's talking about. Who is it that Paul is referring to when he uses the word saints? Who is it that Paul is referring to when he uses the word saint? You and me, Christians. Anybody who has been converted is a saint in the eyes of God. Now, Let's slow down. This doesn't mean we're perfect. This doesn't mean that we can do miracles of any kind. It it just means that we have been called apart to God for his special purpose. We are all saints. We're all saints if we are believers indeed. That's why our background uh, for our stage decoration is photos of all of us. 
Because it reminds us that there's no super class of Christians that have been called to a certain level of holiness, but the rest of us normal Christians are not called to that level of holiness. All of us are saints. All of us are saints. I find an interesting distinction here. Paul does two things. He says this in verse 2. It says, to the church that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified. Sanctified is a past tense word, right? It happened already. And he's referring to the fact that all these believers in the Corinthian church, they have already been sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. He knows that Jesus Christ has died for their sins on the cross and that they have come to faith in that sacrifice. And because of this, God has eliminated the debt of their sin. They've been sanctified in that sense. Past tense. Has already been completed. And yet if we continue reading in this very same verse, Paul encourages them to be saints. He says this, uh, to the church who is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints together with those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Question, if the Corinthians are already saints, if they are already sanctified, why is Paul reminding them that they are called to be something? Why is Paul telling them to be something that he has just mentioned they already are? Paul is making a distinction here. We'll get an answer to that later on. Called to be saints. It's an adjective. He's encouraging them to do something. I'm going to be honest, guys. This series on 1 Corinthians, I'm a little bit fearful of it. I'm a little bit scared of talking about holiness. And the reason why I'm a little bit apprehensive about talking about holiness is because perhaps for many of us, when we hear a discussion of holiness... When we understand that, when we receive that, all we understand is a list of things to do. A list of things that a Christian ought to be doing. And we understand that that is what holiness is. It's just doing all the right things. It's not using bad words. It's not drinking too much beer or any beer at all. It means coming to church on Sundays and that's how I can be a holy person. And what we realize right from the beginning is that Paul's understanding of holiness is so much deeper than a list of things to do. And as we continue through the series, please understand we're not drawing out a list of things for you to do. As we talk about holiness, we want your understanding of holiness to be deeper than this, to be deeper than this. If we're going to embrace God's vision of holiness for our life this year, we better, we better understand exactly what we're talking about. I mentioned we're not encouraging you simply to be better people, to be morally upright Christians. That's not, that's not the foundation of holiness. Ultimately, we're encouraging you to pursue God. We're encouraging you to press into God, to know God, to love God deeper. Holiness, our sanctified life, our moral decisions are a byproduct of our relational proximity, proximity to Jesus Christ. Holiness is a byproduct of knowing a holy God. Holiness is a byproduct of knowing a holy God. We pursue God, and as we pursue him, as we pursue a relationship with him, as we see his character, his character naturally transforms our character to reflect his. That is what holiness is. It's when our character reflects God's good and gracious and beautiful character. Now, you may ask yourself, Jerry, if holiness is really about pursuing God, why don't we have a series on pursuing God? Why don't we have to have a series on the byproduct of pursuing God, that is, holiness? Why a series on the byproduct? Why don't we just skip that and talk about pursuing God? Why this whole series on holiness? Well, we understand that holiness is the fruit of of pursuing God, the fruit of loving God, the fruit of obeying God. And it's important for us to understand holiness because, because if we don't know what the necessary fruit of pursuing God is, we won't be able to recognize that in our own life. We won't be able to recognize growth in our life. We won't be able to know when our pursuit of God is fruitless. You know what doesn't lie? Our our actions can lie as a Christian. 
our actions can be a facade, right? We, we know this. It was so for the Pharisees. They looked perfect on the outside. Their hearts were far from God. We know that our actions can be a facade as believers, but what doesn't lie is the genuine fruit of our life. It's important for us to have an understanding of holiness, of what holiness looks like, because then we can look at our life and say, is my pursuit of God genuine? Is it zealous? Is it full of passion? If it is not, there will be no fruit. There will be no holiness. I think this is probably one of the biggest uh, deceptions that Christians can fall into, where we profess to love God, we profess to want to know Jesus Christ, and yet our lives remain totally unaffected by God's holiness. Our character remains totally untransformed. This is a puzzling, a puzzling conundrum. There is no such thing in the language of the Bible. Someone who has a genuine encounter with the holiness of God has their character transformed necessarily. Remember Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah sees the vision of God. What does he say? What does he say? Woe is me. He doesn't say, man, those are cool special effects. Let me get a photo of that so I can show my friends. He's destroyed He's destroyed. His character is transformed. When we have a genuine experience with God, the fruit of that necessarily shows up in our life. And that's why we study holiness. Because when we study holiness, we can understand what kind of fruit should be coming up in our life. We don't want to be deceived people. You think if I would have gone to the church in Corinth, and I would have, let's pretend we're the church of Corinth here, and I ask any any random Corinthian, hey, um, do you think your church is like, is good? Do you think your church is okay? Do you think your church is going down the, the drain? Or do you think you guys are in a pretty good spiritual place? What do you think the Corinthians would have said? Do you think the Corinthians would have taken such a critical position against their sin as Paul is taking here? The answer is no. No, they would have said, hey, we're, I think we're doing fine. I mean, we got some, I got some areas to work in in my life. I know, the old temple prostitute thing, that's a detail. But I think on the whole, I really love God. I really want to know God. The whole division thing about I am Paul, I am Cephas, look, I, I'm an Apollos guy, okay? I'm an Apollos guy. And it's, it's hard to really relate to a guy who follows Paul. But you know what? I think on the whole, I think we, you know, we're, we're doing what God wants us to do. Paul's position was not that. The Corinthians had fallen into a place of deception because they didn't understand what holiness looked like. We say that we believe in God. We say that we follow Jesus. These are good things. But we ask the question, how do you know? How do you know that your pursuit of God is genuine? How do you know that your love for Jesus Christ is real? How do you know? One of the principal evidences that the Bible gives us of a genuine relationship with God is holiness in the life of the Christian. Evidence. Evidence. I love Paul's introduction. He reminds them that they are secure in Christ. Christian, it doesn't matter where you are or where you've been, if you are a genuine believer, then you are secure in Christ. You're sanctified in that sense. But you're still called to live that identity out. You're still called to be a saint. You're still called to live out holiness in your life. That's Paul's clear message in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians. Then he goes into this prayer, uh, which is pretty customary, by the way. Uh, normally, Paul, in his uh, letters, he'll, he'll pray a thanksgiving prayer over the church that he's writing to. That's pretty common. What's uncommon about the prayer in 1 Corinthians is that it's really short. It's really short. And Paul doesn't thank God for a lot of specific things in the church. He kind of thanks them for general things. It's almost like Paul is writing and saying, I don't have a lot to, <sighs> I don't have a lot to encourage in you guys. You guys are really off. Um, but I'll pray for you and thank the Lord for you nonetheless. Look at, look at the things that he prays for. Starting in verse 4, it says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as a testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you were not lacking in any gift. 
as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ and who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Paul doesn't thank God for a lot of specific things in the Corinthian church, but he does thank God that God is faithful over the first Corinthians, that God is at work in the first Corinthian, in the, in the Corinthian church, that God is working in them, that God has not left them. In this prayer, Paul affirms that God is at work in their life and that their salvation was genuine. The same we can say for us this morning. I don't, I don't know where we are as believers. There's maybe close to 200 of us in this room. I have no doubt there's some of us as believers who have made an absolute disastrous, uh, we've made absolute disastrous decisions as Christians. I mean, we have, we have wrecked our lives. We have wrecked our lives. And then there's some of us as believers that are struggling. We're, we're trying to push through a difficult season in life, and it's not easy. And relationships are not making sense. People that are close to you have made decisions that have hurt you. Whatever the case might be, Paul is reminding these Corinthians what he's reminding you and me this morning, that God is at work in our life, that God's not done with us. He still has hope in our life, and he's going to continue working in us. Paul thanks the Lord for the grace that the Corinthians had received, right, their salvation, the Lord, uh, Paul thanked the Lord that the Corinthian church would, had been enriched by God, had been fully equipped by God. And then he also reminds the Corinthians about their future state, right? Look at verse 8. It says this. He's thanking the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end? Who will sustain you to the end? Well, let, me, let me be honest. That's a pretty bold thing to say to a rebellious church when you have no idea how they're going to react to your letter. <laughs> Um, I just thought of a joke. I'm going to share it with you guys. The, the Corinthian church, they could have grabbed Paul's speech and ripped it up. If, that's, if, you're in a, if you're in a politics, you got that. If you didn't, that's fine. It's a bad joke, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, he didn't know. Paul didn't know if the first Corinthian church was going to throw out his speech. And so for him to thank the Lord that God was going to keep them, and he was going to carry them towards the end. That's a bold prayer. That's a bold prayer. It's almost like Paul is reminding the Corinthian church through his prayer about key aspects of their faith that are going to prepare them for the rebuke that is going to follow. There's very few letters in the New Testament that are as harsh and that press into the local church as much as 1 Corinthians. It's a prayer of thankfulness. It's short, but it's specific. And then we continue between verses 10 and 17 to cover uh, the first concern that Paul has with the Corinthian church, the issue of division, the issue of division. So let's read it, and I want to uh, talk about division very quickly, um, but I want to transition our attention to something else that I think um, is where we want to focus for today. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11, for it's been reported to me by Chloe's people, members of the church, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that he, he dives into specifics. What do you mean by quarreling? Verse 12, what I mean is that each one of you says, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos or I'm of Cephas, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Is Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Let's stop there for one minute. What's going on? This is confusing. There's names. Who are these people? Um, the First Corinthian church had been influenced by a lot of different teachers who had gone through there, okay? You had Cephas, which is really Peter. You had Paul. You had Apollos. And then you had some people that just said that they followed Christ. And apparently there had been this sectarianism, these teams of people, these tribes that had been formed around who these teachers were. You know what? I really like it when Paul preaches on Sunday morning. He's just so much better. I think Peter kind of sucks. Or the same for Apollos, right? And that had created division in the church. It was making troubles and issues between them relating to each other. It was causing problems. And so Paul addresses that here. That's what he's doing. Now, what were the differences between Paul, Apollos, Peter, and Christ? What were the differences? People don't know. They don't know if it was a theological difference. They don't know if it was a difference of preaching style like I just referenced here. 
um, some people even believe that it was a, uh, a difference of race because Paul was a Jew who came from north or f- came from Asia. Uh, Apollos was a Jew that was trained in Alexandria, or he, he was a half Greek as well. Uh, and then Cephas was Peter, who grew up in the Ju- Judea area. And so these Corinthians might have been kind of battling with that whole idea. It's like, who do we listen to? The guy from Greece, the guy from Alexandria? Do we just listen to Jesus? Do we listen to the guy from Judea? Um, so there's some debate as to what the division was about, okay? Paul doesn't specify. You know why Paul doesn't specify? Because it doesn't matter. It could have been that Peter liked wearing red robes and Apollos liked wearing blue. It, it doesn't matter why they were dividing. The point is that they were. And Paul's attack is not to say, look, I get the whole Apollos thing. Nat- honestly, I think I'm right on this issue. Um, but you should seek division. His point has nothing to do as to the reasons why they were dividing. The problem is that they were dividing. That's the problem. That's the problem. And he addresses that. He addresses that. I, um, l- let's continue reading, and then we'll, we'll backtrack a little bit. Verse 14, it says this, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Verse 15, so that none of you may say that you were baptized by his name. I did, I, did, um, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides that, I don't know where I baptized anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. What happened? You know, apparently, part of the division was the fact that Paul had personally baptized a couple of people. Apollos had personally baptized a couple of people. Peter may have baptized some people. And they were maybe using the fact that they had been baptized by these important Christians to prop themselves up and use that as kind of an important thing, right? It's like if I came here this morning and said, look, you guys are awesome Christians and stuff, but I was baptized by Freddie. So you know how that is, right? And then use that as, as a platform for me to be more important. Or maybe someone else was baptized by Billy Graham, and therefore that person is more important in this church. It, it was silliness. It was silliness. It was immaturity. It was their flesh using silly human things to, um, to promote themselves spiritually over each other. It was silliness. Paul is condemning that. He's condemning that. Now, I'm not going to talk about unity this morning, okay? I, I kind of did, but I'm not going to talk about unity this morning. It is enough for us to know that this was one of the primary issues that Paul was alerted to. It was creating a massive schism in the Corinthian church. And that it's something Paul is going to touch on later on. And I'm going to let whoever covers that week talk about that a little bit more. What I want to point out, or I want to call our attention this morning, is to something really interesting. Can we please realize that Paul had just called the Corinthians saints, called out ones, holy ones, set apart for use by the Lord. He had just called them saints. And then in verse 10, and for the rest of the book, he begins to outline all the ways that they were not behaving in very saint-like ways. What's going on? Why would Paul call them saints, and then immediately after he calls them saints, points out how they're not being saints? Why would Paul do that? Why would he call them saints in the first place? Right? Is this a contradiction? Is Paul... Forgetting what he wrote just a few verses before? Probably not. Paul is far too much of a perfectionist. He's far too educated in his writing to allow such an obvious contradiction. Probably not the case. Paul calling the Corinthians saints, could that be empty encouragement? Could that be kind of like this, you know, like this motivational kind of Instagram thing, like you're the best, you're the best, just don't worry about it, everything's perfect with you, Um, let's move on, right? Right? Is it empty encouragement? Is that what it is? Paul is just kind of paying lip service to, about, to butter them up, if you will. Is that what's going on? Probably not. Paul is not the kind of person that would encourage someone with empty words. Why would he encourage them with such empty words if he's going to spend the rest of this book speaking against that? What's going on? Why would Paul call them saints and then a few verses later specifically point out how they're not being saints? Could it be that there's something deeper about holiness, about the nature of holiness that Paul is exposing us to? I think that's the case. How is it that they, the Corinthians, can be both holy and have major character flaws? And I ask that question to us this morning. 
How is it that you can be a believer, a saint, someone who is holy, and at the same time have ma major character flaws? Because you got them, and I got them. We all have major character flaws. How can both of these things be true? I think Paul is pointing this out because he's communicating something deeper about the nature of holiness. And we talked about it in verse uh, 2, right? Paul says that they're sanctified. He references their secure position in Jesus Christ. And then he tells them also that they are called, they're called to live out this holiness, to live out that sanctification. I think the distinction that Paul is making here is that holiness, when it relates to our life, is both our standing as believers and it's also a status that we have as believers. It is our standing and a status. It's a standing and a status. We know what a status is, right? Like when you, we use the term a status update, it's something that exemplifies us in the moment and it changes. Our status changes. Right now, you may be tired. After lunch, you may feel satisfied. After watching a great movie, you may feel happy. Learning that your mortgage is due may make you sad. Our status changes. In some ways, our holiness is the same. Holiness for the believer in many cases is a status, a quality of relationship that can change depending on the temperature of our faith, external circumstances, decisions that we make, our willingness to submit to the will of God. So if we ask the question, in terms of status, were the Corinthians holy? Probably not. They had all sorts of issues. They were called to be holy. That's why they needed to be called to be it. Holiness in terms of our human holiness is a status, but it's also a standing, a standing, a position or state of something that cannot change, secure, unchanging. When we talk about holiness, we also realize that it is a standing, an unchanging truth about our identity that has been given to us by God. It's been conferred to us by an authority greater than us greater than us. It's not dependent on our activity or even on our obedience. And he chooses to relate to us, not on our perfection or lack thereof, but on Christ's perfection. So that when Christ looks at you and me, when God looks at you and me, he chooses not to see our sinful status. He chooses to see our holy standing. Maybe an illustration will help. Maybe an illustration will help to show the difference between the state and the standing. Um, a few weeks ago, I went to jury duty. Anybody been here to jury duty? Okay, so you know the drill, right? You get the thing in the mail, it tells you when to show up. You show up like at 8 a.m. all the way in downtown. And if you live in Kendall, that's a 50 minute drive. You gotta wake up at 6 a.m. Um, I get to the place where they do jury duty. You sit down in the big room where you wait, you watch uh, movies from the mid 2000s. Um, and you, you just wait, you just wait, and you kind of hope you don't get called. I was called, hence the illustration. <laughs> I was called, they called my name, and uh, they walked me into this uh, courtroom, okay? And uh, there was a judge, and he is exactly what you would expect, an old guy with white hair, looks wise, um, and they, they walk you into the room, and at this point, I'm a juror. I've been selected as a juror. I've never been a juror before. I have no idea how to be a juror. Zero idea. I don't even know how I was supposed to dress. Nothing to, didn't know what to expect. But I walked into the room, and the weirdest thing happened. Everybody stood up. Everybody stood up. You got uh, like 18 people walk in the room. There are jurors, random people. And the judge stands up. The lawyer stands up. The defendant stands up. Everybody stands up. And I was like, you know, were they expecting us? I, I don't know. We sat down, we sat down, and then the judge explained to us, he said, look, thank you for being here. I know that many of you have not been jurors before. We know that all of you have lives and that you've, been sa you've sacrificed to be here today. The reason why we stood up is because in the judicial system of the United States, the jury is the party that makes the decision of the facts. They decide what the facts are for the case. And because of that, there's an authority that me as the judge, that I give you guys to be part of this case. And we respect that. The jurors are the judges of the facts. And so the whole courtroom stands up. 
Now, my status as a juror was like zero. I didn't know how to be a juror. I didn't understand what are the implications of that. I just wanted to go home. I was thinking about traffic at 6 p.m. from downtown to Kendall. That's murder. I, I wasn't in a mindset. I wasn't ready to be a juror. That was my status. And yet at the same time, an authority greater than me had conferred upon me an identity that I now stood in. And that was the judge. Didn't matter what my background was, how qualified I was, he gave me the identity of a juror. And that's the difference between our status and our standing as believers. Our standing as saints is that an authority greater than us, God himself, has given you the identity of holiness because of what Jesus Christ has done. That doesn't change. And it certainly doesn't change based on our qualifications as a Christian. But our status is something that is, for all intended purposes, our responsibility. We make the decisions to live up to that identity, to live up to our standing or not. To live up to our standing or not. Or not, And that's the difference, the distinction that we see here that Paul is making the Corinth, with the Corinthians. That's why he can call the Corinthians a sanctified people and be 100% right about that. And then at the same time, go on and point out all of the ways that their status is not aligning with their standing. Paul's great encouragement, I think, in most of the book of 1 Corinthians is that their status align itself with their standing. That's the great point that we want to communicate to you guys. You have been called to be a holy one of God. And if you're a believer, you are already that. That your status line up with your standing. Two things that I'm going to say. Number one, I want to talk to the guys for just a minute here, okay? I don't know where, but somewhere along the road, we may have convinced ourselves that holiness, that purity, that moral uprightness is a feminine trait. That is to say that living a life that is serious about fighting sin and about being pure in the eyes of God, that this is somehow a feminine trait. That I live in the real world and my coworkers use bad words and, and uh, I, live in, uh, I work in a trade where sometimes you have to lie and, and it's, it's just not that clear, Jerry. It's just not that clear. Now I get it. For my wife it may be easy, but for me as a man, I live out in the real world. I have to deal with sinful people. And that makes, the, that makes my living of holiness sometimes difficult. And let me be very clear. Paul is not addressing holiness as a feminine trait. It is something that men are called to do. And whatever the circumstance may be, you can align your status with your standing as a holy man of God. Your wife doesn't have to be holier than you. It's something that you need to embrace. Three things I'm going to say in our pursuit of holiness, okay? As we talk about holiness and if we're wanting to align our status with our standing, number one, it's going to be messy. It's going to be messy. Our transformation is not immediate. It's a struggle. It's not going to be perfect all the time. Number two, a serious commitment to holiness is going to cost you. It means that you will have to let go of things that you love. Surrendering things that your flesh loves. And number three, it will be deeply rewarding and satisfying. Why? Because fulfilling our design as God's children is what we were created to do. Is what we were created to do. And as when we pursue holy living, when we pursue holiness, we're doing nothing more than falling into God's design for you and me as his children. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for the book of 1 Corinthians, Lord, for the fact that you have called us saints, Lord. You've said to all of us in this room that we are sanctified in your eyes, not because we deserve it, not because we know what we're doing, but because of what Christ has done on the cross. But Father, we also thank you that you challenge us and you point out the ways that our life doesn't align with our standing, Lord where our status of holiness isn't where it should be, Father. You point that out. I thank you that you point it out in 1 Corinthians, God. And my, my hope and my prayer is that as we go through this series, Father, that you would make that clear in our lives, God. Where is our status not lining up with our standing as sanctified people, Lord? We want to pursue you, Father. We want to know you. We want to love you. And we know, God, 
that one of the necessary fruits of an encounter with you is a life of holiness. We want to pursue that, God. We want your character to change our character. We pray for these things, man, in your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, thanks for coming. You have, you guys have a great Sunday. We will see you guys for the second part of this series.